Yeah. That's very weird. Maybe maybe mice just ha- actually are are have a form of vitalism. <laughs> the, um, I wonder if you can change someone's personality by giving them antibiotics. Then I mean, it was Ooh. listed in another study that this one or that was referencing this paper, um, and they were saying they were looking at um, MRIs of volunteers, like to see their brain structure, and then comparing uh, taking samples of their gut microbiome and seeing that like there was some sort of not collection, connection, but like correlation between people who had certain structures in their brain or certain connections in their brain and had similar microbiomes. Um, sure. Okay. So, um, antibiotics, you would think, um, you know, they kill off microbes. Um, but what is cool about them is they were actually, um, developed from microbes, uh, fungi in particular. Um, So penicillin is the big broad spectrum one you always hear about, and it was the the discovery and development of it heralded the dawn of the antibiotic age. So before that, like before penicillin, like there was no treatment for infections. So you basically just had to wait it out and hope it went away. Um, Oh god, which I imagine was awful. (laughs) Um, So even though um, the discovery of penicillin is attributed to Alexander Fleming, who was a British bacteriologist. Um, the discovery that some molds killed bacteria was made 32 years prior to Fleming's discovery by Ernest Duchesne. I don't want to. Who is a French? Duchesne. Duchesne? Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. I believe that is right. Um, a French physician. Um, so I couldn't find a like really good. Uh, citation or like a source on exactly how he figured it out but i found in a few that they said that um he noticed that stable boys at the army hospital um would put the saddles in dark rooms and sort of encourage mold to grow on them um and they said it was to help heal the saddle sores on the horses which i thought was really neat Mm. Mm. um so basically he was intrigued and he um did work on it i think he was some or injecting um animals who had uh some sort of infection with this mold i think it was i'm not 100 percent sure of the mold that he actually was using um and he submitted his dissertation um called contribution to the study of vital competition in microorganisms antagonism between molds and microbes so basically he was like his dissertation on was what penicillin was doing. Um, yeah. But this is... You just didn't quite make the connection that there was, like, a compound being excreted or something, right? Mm-hmm. And basically, because he was sort of an unknown, um, who he submitted the dissertation to didn't do any research, and it was forgotten for 32 years. Oh, that's a shame. We could have... Mm-hmm. Everybody would be alive. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> all everywhere. Everybody would be alive right now. Uh <laughs> Um, I don't know. The rediscovery um, of penicillin by Alexander Fleming is also a cool story. Um, So basically, he um, was in, uh, he had gone on holiday and had come back to his lab. And this is in 1929. Uh, And he was sorting, I guess he was growing uh, Staphylococcus, which is a bacteria that causes boils, sore throats, and abscesses. So awful. Um, And he was sorting through Petri dishes, um, which was growing this. So he was opening them prior to throwing them out into cleaning solution and noticed that one of them had been contaminated by mold. And coming from someone who has plated lots of bacterial plates, it's the worst thing in the world when something is contaminated by mold and it happens so (laughs) easily. Um, But in this case, he uh, noticed that the area, like there were colonies of Staphylococcus growing on it, but he noticed that the area immediately surrounding the mold had no staph colonies at all. So it um, suggested that the mold had secreted something that was stopping the bacteria from growing, which is really cool. So anyway, so uh, a lot of what I was reading on penicillin, apparently Fleming was working on it with a while. So the mold itself, um, finding it that could kill uh, like a lot of bacteria. Um, but it wasn't until 1940 when um, Howard Florey, Ernest Chain, and um, colleagues at Oxford University um, they were actually extracting the penicillin from it, um, and they were injecting penicillin molds into live mice. 
Um, successfully, they were protecting them against the infection from deadly streptococci. Um, and it took a lot of, uh, apparently it's very hard to synthesize and sort of extract it from the mold itself. Yeah. How do they, do they, you know how they do it now? In the modern day, it's actually, um, still made in penicillium. So in the same molds, basically, they're still grown and developed from the same mold that Fleming had found. That's a shame. I was hoping it was in a coli or something. Something easier to grow and deal with. Yeah. Mm. And they make it in giant <laughs> bioreactors, right? They make it in like giant steel vats. It's just a huge 10,000 gallons of penicillium mold. Oh, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, bacteriophages? Yes, bacteriophages, which I... Um, so we're going from antibiotics to bacteriophages. Um, so basically, bacteriophages were um, discovered in 1971 by a Canadian biologist, Felix um, De Herel. Um I'm awful at Derrell. Derrell. Yeah, Derrell. I have to roll my <laughs> R's, I'm sorry. Um, so anyways, he published a paper um, announcing the, the discovery of the bacteriophage, which is a virus that preys on bacteria. Okay, uh, a bacteria is a tiny little cell, uh, so it's similar to what all of living things are made up of, made up of uh, except they have slightly different stuff inside them, versus a virus, which is usually just a protein, uh, and some nucleic acid in the middle. So mm. I, I always think of a virus like a caramel, caramel, where it's got like uh. the... The chocolate <laughs> protein coating and then the nice nucleic acid caramel center. Yeah, we have no idea where they came from. Yeah. That is we'll the strangest analogy I've ever heard. <laughs> I but like it. It makes sense, so it's good. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, so bacteriophages are viruses that prey on bacteria, right? Yes. Bacteriophages, um, as we said mm -hmm. before, are viruses, and they consist of a polyhedral head and a helical tail. Um, and inside the head is where all the genetic material is, DNA, RNA, and all that such. Um, so they're useful for um, killing bacteria because of the way they that they replicate, um, which is basically mm -hmm. uh, five steps. So they attach to the bacteria. Um, they uh, enter the bacteria. So basically they're inserting their genetic material. Um, then they synthesize using the bacteria's um, enzymes and ability, like, it's... Um, so they're stealing from the bacteria. Basically, yep. To recreate themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they nice. assemble everything that has been made, and once there's enough of them, they just burst the cell and all release and escape, and it's just killing the bacteria, basically. Sweet. Rinse and repeat? Yeah. Alien style. Exactly. <laughs> So it's, kill it's getting rid of bacteria in, like, the coolest way possible. So um, the reason that is this is advantageous is because, um, although I didn't mention it when I was talking about penicillin, um, when you take antibiotics, they're basically killing both your good microbes, so in your, um, uh, like, your gut, stomach, and all that, and they are killing your... The bad, as well as the bad ones, which is not good because, as I said before, your microbiome is super important for loads of different reasons. Um, so the bacteriophages, um, conversely, are super specific. So each phage is attacking a specific strain of bacteria. So it's only like so the treatment of infections with phages is only effective if the phages are carefully matched to the disease causing the bacteria. The disease causing bacterium, so whatever's causing the infection or problem in the person. Um, but yeah, so it, it would be useful because our good bacteria would not be harmed, hopefully, when they're using the phages to kill the bad bacteria. Uh, Aren't they also useful because they can uh, mutate alongside the bacteria if you keep them together? Yes. So normally when a penicillin would be, say, become ineffective because the bacteria figured out a way around it, mm -hmm. um, the bacteriophages would change as well, making it could, so that they can... Yeah, could, hopefully, would uh, <laughs> change change and become... And it would just be like a constant fight, but it would be a fight we could win. So rather than losing more antibiotics all the time, we'd be 
instead using um or coming up with new ones as quick as the uh, bacteria or quicker because uh, viruses uh, reproduce quicker than bacteria. This is true. And it also... And we wouldn't even have to do any work. The virus would just evolve for us. Yeah. I mean, as long as it's not, like, inducing some sort of um, infection response, like the virus itself is, like, inducing some sort of response in our body. Yeah. As long as it's not infecting host cells, right? Well, I mean, it, like you're killing bacteria, so like exotoxins and stuff could be released, which would be causing like a ah. huge problem. Um, True story. Yeah. Is there a is there a good reason we're not using these now? Um, there are some issues with them. Um, so the specificity of them is also um, a good thing while also being a bad thing. So um, you have to find out what you're infected with, obviously, to mm. um, be able to tailor the phages. Um, to your in, like specific infection, and because it takes a little That's while, it's possible costly, that the, yeah. well, it's costly, and it's also the possible the bacteria may just evolve or like change um, while and you're getting the phages. And sometimes, when you're treating an infection, you don't know exactly what the bacteria is, right? Mm-hmm. You get like a vague idea. You like, oh yeah, we know that it's a gram negative bacteria which is just like a type of bacteria and it has it causes these symptoms so we'll give an antibiotic that will kill this 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 all these different bacteria that could be causing it yeah so and more it of works a blanket um yeah. approach which i mean is good but you know people take so much and then we have antibiotic resistant bacteria now which is not good um, but which, I mean, phages could help with, like they're resistant to how antibiotics kill, right? Um, but phages have a different method of, um, getting rid of the bacteria. So hopefully that would also be effective. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, so bacteriophages also can have the opposite effect of killing the bacteria or, um, like, I guess helping us out with getting rid of the bacteria. They can also make bacteria more lethal. Um, what? <laughs> so the way uh, no. bacteria, so the way bacteria, so if a phage had picked up, because they the way they replicate, they insert their genetic, like their DNA or RNA or whatever, and it's replicated into in the hosts um, with their cellular machinery. Thank you, their uh, machinery. Um, it's possible um, with some bacteria phages there. Um, DNA is integrated into the DNA of the bacteria. Um, so it sort of just like grows in there and it gets replicated and just sort of waits it out, I guess, until it's a better um, time for the bacteriophages to um, assemble and to uh, burst the bacterial cell. Um, and sometimes some of the um, bacteriophages DNA remains in the bacteria's uh, DNA. So when the bacteriophages are, um, uh, uh, their DNA is excised from the bacteria DNA, some of the bacteriophages DNA is left over. And if the bacteriophage happened to pick up a toxin coding gene, um, it could be left oh, in the bacteria. No. And then the bacteria uh, produces it. Yeah. And then it That's becomes um, toxic and can become lethal. Um, which Nasty. is actually the case with um, non-toxic strains of bacteria, which causes cholera, which is Vibrio cholera. Hmm. Cholerae? Yeah, cholerae. Cholerae. Vibrio cholerae. Um, and they've been known to become toxic through a type of bacteriophage, which uh, integrates its genomes into the host bacteria. So that is a huge Ouch. problem. <laughs> That's actually a really cool thing just on its own to be able to put your... Like, the fact that they reverse transcribe their genetic information into the host? Yeah. Because that happens with us, too, right? So this would be something, obviously, that is a huge problem and completely goes against what you're wanting to do. You're wanting to get rid of bacteria in people, and this would make it more lethal and would make much more of a much bigger problem. Um and lastly, um, so in order to work, the bacteriophage has to get to the same place that the bacteria are, um, but they may not necessarily reach the same places um, that the antibiotics can reach or even to where the bacteria are, so it may not be that effective. 
Well, what do you mean by that? So viruses and bacteria, they, I guess, like move or travel differently. They have their own Mm -hmm. um, individual ways of getting there. And bacteria, or sorry, antibiotics is more of a, uh, I guess because they're all different things. Like they get to places differently. And antibiotics is ingested Mm -hmm. or injected or anything like that. And it. So you're saying that we would have to apply a phage to a particular spot and it wouldn't be able to keep up if the like the infection went somewhere else? Um, not necessarily. Well, yeah, for instance, if you had a um, urinary tract infection, mm-hmm. you'd want to use a uh, antibiotic that will be excreted into your urine, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you would like take it orally and then it would be excreted into your urine where it would do its thing and kill the bacteria. But maybe a bacteriophage can't reach there, so you'd have to, I don't know, inject it directly into the person's bladder or something. That's when you pull out the catheter. No. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then you have, if the uh, infection becomes systemic, so it, like, reaches the bloodstream, then it goes to all different places, then you could use an antibiotic that would go to everywhere, but bacteriophage, you might not be able to do that, right? Yes. Mm. We should just give the bacteriophages some antibiotics. <laughs> Here, take this to them. Take this to the, to the bacteria. We can use it like horses. Get around. Yeah. Cool. So bacteriophages, good microbes. Very uh, exciting, too. Antibiotics made by good microbes and microbiome. Lots of good microbes. I would like to talk about uh, Clostridium difficile which is a bacteria you may have, may have heard about. There are, uh, every so often, there is outbreaks of this infection in hospitals or um, old age homes, uh, nursing homes, stuff like that. Uh, but it's a bacterium that's found in the uh, gastrointestinal tracts of between 2 and 5% of the population. And most of the outbreaks occur in hospital settings. And I'll tell you why. Uh, So C. difficile is in the Clostridium genus, or family of bacteria. It's the same genus that brought you tetanus, botulism, and deadly gas gangrene. So this is a really nasty group of organisms. They just famous genus. (laughs) They are the worst things. Except unless, I guess, you have wrinkles and you take Botox. Then you like them. Uh, But yeah, botulism toxin is the most potent toxin in the world. You can kill billions of people with like less than a gram of it yeah we can't even measure the ld50 which is the amount uh, uh, you have to give to a population before 50 percent of them dies um and so you mean it's too small it's so small we can't measure it yeah <sighs> normally uh, it's measured in micrograms uh and how many micrograms per kilogram of weight um uh, of the uh, species it usually translates very nicely between mice and humans so we usually test it on mice uh but the there's such a small dose we can't even measure it properly so uh it's something like less than one nanogram wow <laughs> so <laughs> yeah bottom yeah, line you don't need much this is a nasty nasty group of bacteria and C. difficile fits right in. Uh, <laughs> most of the time, there are so few C. difficile bacteria that are in our bodies that we don't even notice them. So there's like, they, there could be literally five bacteria of C. difficile among the 10 to the 14 bacteria in our body. Uh, so we don't even notice their effects. And this is because all of the other bacteria, the microbiome that uh, Jessica was talking about, in our bodies are always competing with C. difficile and with each other for food, nutrients. And this struggle keeps the numbers of any particular bacterium relatively low. So no one can quite get a foothold to, like, take over. Everyone's competing uh, for nutrients. But say you go into the hospital with an infection, like a throat infection or something, or a uh, urinary tract infection, and they give you antibiotics. These antibiotics will kill not only the urinary tract infection bacteria, but they'll also kill a whole bunch of your microbiome. And they'll leave the resistant microbes, like C. difficile. So then you've got this whole vast expanse, this huge, lovely colon to grow in, and no one else around. And the C. difficile are like, well, time to get busy, so... 
they multiply rapidly, and then they begin right, secreting what, toxins. Oh, I was gonna say, what do they start? What do they do? What, what's their what's their mean part? Yeah, they secrete toxins, and these toxins produce diarrhea and inflammation of the large intestine, which is called colitis. And this causes pain, fatigue, cramping, bloating, fever, bleeding, and potentially tearing of the large intestine, which can lead to death. Yeah. Really nasty. Uh, treatment. So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something then. So if, like, antibiotics can cause, like, resistant microbes to take over, why do we have such a long, like, antibiotic? Like, you have to take it for, like, two weeks, even if you start feeling better after the first week. Would it make more sense to stop when you feel better? Because uh, the uh, your your sense of well being isn't tied to how much bacteria is in your body. <laughs> um, mm. You're like it, even if you're taking say say you stop taking it and then mm -hmm. the bacteria that have stuck make around will will now be more resistant. So if you if it does come back, then you'll have a harder time getting rid of it again. Mm. Antibiotics. That's that's troubling. <laughs> yeah, they 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 know why they know how long you should have it to be safe, mm. and the 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 uh, the negative to that, if they didn't mm -hmm. weren't erring on the side of caution, is you could be sicker mm -hmm. later. So even though it and does it cause more, more problems, right? they have to be like, well, you got to take it. <laughs> you know, uh, man. Yeah. So, treatment for C. difficile includes some things you'd expect, like proper prescribing of antibiotics to prevent serious infections, and stronger antibiotics like uh, metronidazole or vancomycin, which are my um, antibiotics that kill microbes that don't use oxygen. So most of your microbes use oxygen, and so if you use a strong antibiotic and a specific one to kill the C. difficile, then that'll keep your microbiome intact. But treatment also includes some things that you wouldn't expect, including a stool transplant. And that is exactly what you think it is, where you donate your feces, or worse yet, you get someone else's donated feces, and you implant them into your intestine. And that helps jumpstart the bacterial colonies in your gut to start competing with C. diff again. And because yeah, you know those guys will do well. Yeah. So it's just sort of like a... A bacteria. It's like a little little microclimate transfer, you know? <laughs> exactly. It's pretty cool. It's kind of a nasty thought, but hey, it works. It replaces the normal healthy bacteria that were killed by the antibiotics you took previously. But the real heroes in this story are the humble anonymous microbes that live in your gut and compete with C. difficile every day, keeping it suppressed and protecting you in the process. Can I ask a question? About the yeah. uh, stool transplant, which is a little oh, bit off of topic, but I'm sort of curious. Um, are they transplanting it like during some sort of surgery directly into your intestines, or how is it getting there? Like, uh, is it just? I don't know that for sure, but I wouldn't imagine they'd put you out. For that. <laughs> no, no, I think they probably just like get a thick, a wide gauge syringe, and yeah, a double sided wow. toilet. <laughs> a double-sided toilet. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Mackie. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, that's an awful thought. I hate that I said that. <laughs> Mackie, what do you Back got for us? Back to our roots. So I started, um, or I wanted to do a skeptical topic, the probiotics, the classic yogurt commercial catch, um, which is a contentious topic. Most people aren't quite sure if it's effective or not, so I looked into it. Can you um, quick define what probiotics are? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so probiotics are basically, are, are, in the broadest sense, it actually has multiple definitions, but in the broadest sense, it, it's any bacteria that are good in your gut. Okay. So uh, you can take probiotics, and that's intended to become gut bacteria, um, which is not a very good definition, mind you. Um, I thought there would be a better one, but there's not. Um, but yeah, uh, all these microorganisms in yogurt tend to have lots of health claims, and um, the some of the health claims include uh, treatment against Heliobacter pylori, so that's, um, or pylori, 
if you're Keegan, I bet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the um, what, what is that is, guy? What's, it's what's... the gut bacteria, the bad gut bacteria that causes uh, ulcers. So, um, so they they say that maybe that's a displacement thing. I suppose is the uh, idea there. It can uh, it can modulate inflammation, uh, give uh, relief to allergies, lactose intolerance, high cholesterol, diarrhea, vitamin production blood pressure, maintenance of immune function, vaginosis, uh, weight loss, and gain. But here's the interesting <laughs> thing. I looked into the evidence for all of these claims, and uh, I have a very rudimentary ruling for, for each of them, but um, basically they're pretty poor. So there's some studies for every one of those claims I made, and some of them are positive and some of them are negative, but none of them are justifiable. You would never... On, based on what we have on this, you would never want to make a call on that. You wouldn't want, I would never say that these are actually causing this. The thing we do best have evidence for is uh, is actually weight loss or gain. And I say gain because that's where the evidence points. Uh, probiotics actually tend more so to lead to weight gain than loss. That's interesting. Not how they're marketed. Um no. <laughs> so <laughs> not how they're marketed. Yeah, that's just an epidemiological effect, but uh there are a lot of studies uh underway that will be really like definitive on this, mm -hmm. but as far as it stands, the European Food Safety Authority um says that the scientific evidence remains insufficient to prove any health benefit for the product. So the only viable alternative so far is a fecal transplant. <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> Take that, yogurt commercials. Jeez. Yeah. Um, but yeah, basic rundown of the current evidence of probiotics. Not quite there. I honestly do, based on the research, kind of seem to think that it will help some things. But it probably won't help everyone. It'll probably just help people who actually need help. You know, it's not like just something you take to make your life better. Yeah. It's something you'd be prescribed or something that you may need, you know, like a low sodium diet kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. A lifestyle yeah. change. Yeah, but it's not something like just you should just give everyone. Yeah. Um but yeah, there are some side effects as well. Uh the in a Dutch study, um they gave probiotics to peop to people who had acute pancreatitis and uh those with taking probiotics had a 16% chance of death, while those without had a 6% chance of death. Oh, so that's not helpful. It's a minor effect, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but it was an, it was uh, 300 people, so it's a tiny little... Uh, not tiny study. It's actually a pretty good study, I suppose. Um, but the there's a placebo-controlled Australian study that showed children given probiotics in their first six months of life were more likely to develop allergies. Interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hmm. So, kind of some counterintuitive stuff there. Uh, yeah, just kind of look out and don't buy yogurt because you want probiotics. Just buy yogurt because it's delicious, especially <laughs> lemon. Exactly. Lemon, no, 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 really? fruit bottom oh. yogurt. Lemon yogurt? Lemon's it was a, such delicious. a surprise to me. And it oh, was wow. so good. I'll have to try that. <laughs> Hello and welcome to our game section. Uh, Gap facts. So we are going to tell you a couple of easily repeatable pieces of trivia, uh, just for your general interest and to repeat to your friends. So go ahead, Alyssa. Okay. Eighty percent of people think that they are above average drivers. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ask ask anyone. Well, okay, ask ten people, and eight of them will be like, "Oh yeah, I, I'm a great driver." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I totally, I totally buy that. I my gap fact is that the word escalate comes from the word escalator, not the way, other way around. Mm. Oh, so, cool. yeah. Oh, clever. I like it. Uh, well, my gap fact is, uh, though currently only endemic to hot Middle Eastern regions, camels originally uh, are from North America. They originated no in North America 45 million years ago and lived in the <sighs> Arctic. They also used to be 30% cool. bigger, weigh 900 kilograms, and stand about 2.7 meters high at the shoulder. Wow. So we used to have giant Arctic camels in North America. 
pretty cool. And I guess they're conserving water still makes sense. Yeah, yeah. There's Arctic uh, camels now. They're just not really talked about as much as the uh, their hot cousins. <laughs> 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 oh, that is a universal truth, isn't it? All right, uh, <laughs> Jessica, you've got a quiz for us, right? I do. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I, unfortunately, I didn't give it like a... What you guys are going to be doing is I'm going to be giving you a condition, so like a disease or whatever. And so there's the potential for um, two points for each question. You have to say if it's a bacteria, a virus, or other um, is causing the infection or the condition is one point. And the second point is if you can give me the name of the microbe that is doing it. Either the family or the species is what I will accept. Okay, okay so is this going to be like a first to answer or are we all going to... I'll answer. I'll answer, okay. Yeah, and I have... So there's, yeah, the potential for two points each question. And this is... I know some, like, conditions can be caused by other bacteria or other viruses or such, but I'm going by whatever came up, like the first result that came up when I was looking for these conditions. Okay. 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 So the primary cause. Most okay. common. All right. How many questions? Sorry. Ten. So there's the potential okay. for Ten. 20 points. Ooh, All right. Okay. And Somebody I, keep track of the score. <laughs> I, I already have an Excel sheet going. <laughs> wow. Nice. I, I got to know. You guys, like, no one ever keeps track, so I got to keep track. <laughs> A oh, victor will sorry. be announced. <laughs> 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 All right, let's go. Question one. Okay. The first one is necrotizing fasciitis or the flesh-eating disease. Okay. So my guess is that it is a virus called necra something or other. Okay. Because that that has a Latin root. And I bet that they found the, the disease before they found the thing that caused it. So then they probably named it after it. That's my guess. All right, Keegan, why don't you go next? <laughs> but I know this. <laughs> Keegan? Oh, it's <laughs> You're going to steal my answer. Show me yeah. disease. <laughs> <laughs> go back and go. Uh, it's a bacteria and I don't remember its name. <laughs> uh, it's a bacteria and strep pyogenes. All right. So Mackie gets one. Keegan gets two. And oh, unless, yeah. unfortunately, it's a bacteria. So the second one is gonorrhea. Um, bacteria and gonorrhitis infectus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'll go with the virus to be different. And gonorrhea. There we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's bacteria. And <laughs> it's either mycoplasma or mycobacteria. I'm going well, to go, go with myco- mycoplasma gonorrhea. Okay. <laughs> gonorrhea. There's like A's and E's and I's at the end. So it sounds like my guess was close to the pronunciation. Okay, so I have bacteria, and it's Neisseria gonorrhea. Oh, crap. Well, so, it seems like me and oh, Keegan tied up. So Mackie gets one. <laughs> Keegan, what did you say? I know bacteria, but what was the other one? Not I that. I said, yeah, yeah was I was wrong. Okay, one. And I'm Alyssa. <laughs> oh, I'm that's giving embarrassing. You, Alyssa, I'm giving you one because you got the species. Okay. I like the name of this one. Um, so it's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So I guess I'll go first, and I'll say that it's a bacteria, because I haven't guessed that yet. And um... You guys know there is an other option, right? Yeah, but you just said that you liked the name of the thing, the microbe. I think she's thing. saying that so it's I not you, necessarily... You purposely... It's, I, think it's a be- I think it's a parasite. Oh, that sounds like a good guess. I'm going to say it's some sort of protist. Uh, okay, so it's definitely a protist or a protozoa. I, I have no idea beyond that. Um, Alyssa, what was yours, hon? Bacteria. Okay, so um, it is a bacteria. Oh, no! Oh, no. Okay. I don't feel so bad about my loss, but I feel good about Alyssa's win and good about Keegan's loss. <laughs> okay, and the name of it is my favorite, and it's Rickettsia Rickettsi. Oh, oh, it sounds like an really... Italian guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well. So the next one is malignant tertian malaria. So it's a form of malaria and it's called black water fever. Hmm. Well, malaria is a virus, I think. I could be wrong. Oh my gosh. No science knowledge. <laughs> and then <sighs> Niger malarius. I don't know. That makes sense. I uh, isn't it like plasmodium or something like that? Yeah. Are you gonna <laughs> guess what it is? I mean, aside from its what it is, it's a protist. Okay. I'm gonna go with uh, protozoa, and what? Can you give me the the exact thing again? The exact it's disease? Malignant tertian malaria. It's All right, well, I'll say plasmodium. That's what I'll go with. Okay, so it is a protozoa, and it is plasmodium falciparum. Oh, I was going to say that. Damn. Okay. You did it, Well, we got though. plasmodium. That does it. Didn't I say plasmodium as well? You did. I said I either two. or. You get a point if you get either oh, or. Oh, okay. Because, okay. I mean, they're giant words. Like, yeah, these are like random pulls. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, so. It was not right. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it was. <laughs> okay. okay, so the next one is polio. Well, that's a virus. If I ever saw one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know what it's called. Well, I guess I'll guess virus because Mackie sounded really sure of that. And um, polonia. I don't know. I'm going to go with the virus as well, and I can't remember the name. So it is a virus, and it's polio virus. Oh, like seriously? Yeah. I thought there was I'm, something more complicated. That's all that's I could dumb. find. I mean, it may be something com- more complicated, but that's literally all I could find. <laughs> okay, so the next one is tuberculosis. It's a virus. No, it's an other. We're going to guess other for the first time. I'm going to say it's a virus, and I'm going to say it is... Um... Tuberculosis is one of the the names. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bacteria, mycoplasm, or sorry, mycobacteria tuberculosis. All right, so Keegan is right on all counts. It's mycobacterium tuberculosis, yeah. and it wow. is a bacteria. Mm. So Mackie, I gave you the point for just saying tuberculosis because I mean it was the species. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So it's called hairy cell leukemia. Um and it's called that because of distinctive extensions of the cytoplasmic membrane of infected cells. You know what causes a lot of cancer? HPV. So I'm going to say HPV causes this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a virus. Um well I'll say it's other and that it's called is it, I, I think leukemia has something to do with your white blood cells or sometimes your red blood cells. I don't know. Blastoise is something. Okay. It's a virus and <sighs> I'm going to go with herpes virus. Uh, okay. So it is a virus <gasps> and it's human Papilloma. T lymphotrophic virus 2. Oh, oh. well... Um, so Keegan gets one, Alyssa gets zero, Mackie gets one, because both of you said I think I said virus. virus. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. That was the V in HPV. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was the example I was going to use. I'm like, oh, like, you know, viruses cause cancer. Yeah. You know, it happens. Okay. So the next one is leprosy. Oh, I should know about this. Oh, so <laughs> should I. <laughs> <laughs> um, leprosy. That was a big deal at... At one point or another. I mean, still yeah. is in some places. Um, leprosy. Well, I'll guess bacteria. And I'll guess leprosy is in the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Alyssa because mm. I mean, after, if I think it's, it's got like a lot of bacteria like behavior, you know, <laughs> As far as I've observed from my desk, um, and it's, uh, <laughs> and, and it's uh, you know, it's like one of those things that we discover after we knew about the disease. Yeah, so exactly. I think it'd be named for the virus or for the, for the bacteria. Mm-hmm. I mean, so yes, I'm, I'm gonna go with uh, gonna go with Alyssa. Alrighty, Keegan. 
I'm going to say it's a bacteria. I actually don't know this for sure, though. Uh, and I'll say, like, Lepromatus is part of the name. Okay, so um, it is a bacteria, so all of you get a point. Yay! Awesome. And Keegan is the only one who gets the second point. Um, oh. Uh, the two I have listed is Mycobacterium leprae or Mycobacterium lepromatosis. Uh, well, it says it has lepra. I should have kept. Oh, I should have kept with my pattern of just making up words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one should be easy. Um, based solely on the fact that it was mentioned earlier today. Heliobacter pylori, Clostridium. Um. So, <laughs> gastric or peptic ulcers, Mackie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Alyssa? No, Mackie. Mackie, know. go first. Heliobacter pylori. What is it? It's a bacteria. Okay. Mackie's <laughs> That's That's what I'm going with. I concur. No science knowledge ever. I'm already proud of my score. We're okay. Good. And then, Keegan, you're saying the same? Yeah. Okay, you're all GWM. right. GWM. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's bound to happen in any show with this kind of specific example knowledge you know <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i thought you would enter that oh can i like insert an anecdote about this bacteria sure okay so in order to like um determine that uh something uh like a disease or a condition or whatever is being caused by a bacterium there's like um you have to show that like if you inject the bacterium or whatever into something it gets the condition you're saying it's um, causing. Responsible for causing, yeah. Okay. So um, the um, person, uh, Barry Marshall, is the person who um, just like determined that like peptic ulcers were caused by helicobacteria or heliobacter pylori. Um, and what happened was um, he was having trouble infecting piglets with this bacteria. Um, so what he ended up doing was had a baseline endoscopy done and just drank a petri dish of it. Um, and just three days later just developed an ulcer and was able to show that Helicobacteria pylori was um, causing, like, ulcers. That is how all the best experiments are done. I can't find any ethical test subjects, <laughs> therefore. Um, okay, so my last one is sleeping sickness. <laughs> oh, man. I know this. What is this? Keegan, do you share my frustration? Yes. I heard him just making <laughs> grumpy noises. <laughs> oh, this is like rabble. right, right Stop on rabbling. the. It's like right on the outer edge of my circle of knowledge. <laughs> oh, somebody should have studied. <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> oh my god, it's on the tip of my tongue. I'm gonna hit myself. Well, it's when definitely I get not it. on the tip of mine. So I'm gonna say other, and I'm gonna say I don't know the name. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a. Oh, I think it's an other as well. Is anyone and? gonna guess the name or? Uh, I'm I'm also gonna say it's an other. I'm gonna say. Sure you are jumping on my bandwagon. <laughs> I know I'm no. just, I'm just <laughs> Napus sleepitus. It's <laughs> 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 a great guess. I'll go with the uh, plasmodium, again. I'll say it's another <laughs> plasmodium. Um. So all of you are right that it's other. It's a protozoa. Yeah. Um, it is Trypanosoma oh, brucea. Oh, my God. Brucia. I knew this. Or, uh, ah. Yeah. This ah. is Bio 1 stuff. Oh, oh, man. I can't believe that. <laughs> test, test, test. Trypanosoma. That's right. All right. So the final scores. Alyssa bringing up the rear at 7. Um, Mackie nice. comes in at 11. And Keegan has 14. Damn. Hmm. Him. Sad score. Sad score for a medical student. <laughs> Especially someone well, who just did infectious disease. Almost seventy five percent. It's a pass in medical school. It is a pass in medical school. <laughs> well, I'm sure there are just so many. You don't have to be so hard on yourself. Sure. He should be hard on it. I should be hard on myself. <laughs> <clears throat> That's basic stuff. Okay. Go review. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, Jessica. that was a good quiz. Yay. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Jessica. It was great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Uh, and that's our show. Email comments and questions to mindthegaphosts at gmail.com. 
Our next show will be called A Study in Color. Subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Double Twist, or the podcast feed of your choice, and be sure to like or rate us depending on your platform. Thanks for listening. Most bacteria won't hurt us. They're harmless and even do us good. In fact, we have bacteria living inside of us that help to keep us healthy. But some are just plain nasty and can make you very sick if they get inside of you.